Hi guys, it's Alex here and today we're going to show a game played between a young Magnus Carlsen and uh, one of the top Russian players and indeed one of the best players in the world, Alexander Grishuk. Now, this game was played 10 years ago and Magnus Carlsen had already established himself as uh, one of the very, very strongest players uh, in the world. The game was a Sicilian defense. It started with e4 and Grishuk responded with c5. And Magnus continued with knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4. We have an open Sicilian on the board. Black played knight f6, attacking the pawn on e4. And now knight to c3. After a6, this is the so-called Nidorf variation of the Sicilian defense. It's one of the most popular variations. And white continued classically with the move bishop to e2. Now at this point, black chose to play e6 rather than the advance in the center of e5. And so this is, to, uh, this is playing in the Skeveningen or Scheveningen style. After this, Magnus Castle, and black continued his development with bishop to e7. Magnus's next move, a4, is aimed at preventing black from advancing with b5 and taking space on the queen side. And not just taking space on the queen side, but also being able to fianchetto his bishop. And from here, the bishop and the knight will combine to put pressure on the e4 pawn. So a4 was played, and now black played knight to c6, developing a piece and attacking white's central knight. Bishop e3, supporting the center, black castle, and now white increased his grip over the center by advancing his f-pawn, f4. Now we see that white has two pawns that are quite centrally placed, and Black, on the other hand, he has pawns on both of the most central files, E and D files, but they are pushed a little bit behind. So we notice that white is playing along four ranks, while black is playing along three. The question is, can white use that space advantage to his benefit? For now, the play is proceeding very normal, according to chess theory, and black here develops his queen and puts it on the useful C7 square. White, after the move pawn to f4, is a little bit vulnerable along this diagonal. So he sidesteps his king to h1, where the king will be safer. Black plays the rook to e8, and this move is intended because white at some point may push e5 or push f5, and so the rook on e8 will be um, very well placed if the center opens up. It's x-raying the two bishops on e3 and e2. White now plays bishop f3, supporting e4 further. Black drops his bishop back to f8 to activate the scope of this rook, and now white plays queen d2. Notice how of all the white pieces, the bishop on e3 was undefended. So white forms a queen bishop battery and defends the bishop on e3. Now black plays rook to b8. With this move, black intends possibilities connected with knight takes knight, and after recapture, let's imagine a position like this, to be able to finally advance on the queen side with b5. Since white is playing in the center and king side, black wants to generate counterplay on the queen side. White plays the queen to f2 and forms a new bishop, uh, new queen bishop battery on the g1 to a7 diagonal. Black changes direction and plays e5. He strikes at f4 and at d4, and he claims a bigger slice of the pie in the center. White captures the pawn, black captures back, and here white plays knight to b3. Now one thing to notice is that this pawn on e4 has now become an isolated pawn. By isolated pawn, we mean that white doesn't have a pawn on 
either the D file or the F file, the files adjacent to this pawn. Keep that in mind because in the future we see that a weak pawn like this is generally not desirable and Magnus will take the opportunity to uh, get rid of that isolated pawn. Let's see how that happens very soon. For now, black plays knight to b4, striking at the pawn on c2. It's defended, but now, for example, white can no longer move his queen away from the defense of the pawn and into an attack on the king side, because knight takes c2 would be a really devastating move. Magnus' idea is very typical here with his next move. He plays bishop a7. This is a hard move to play at a club level or at a beginner level. But the, the point is that the rook on b8, we had said, is supporting a possible b5 push. So by playing bishop a7, the rook is forced back onto a8, which is less useful of a square. And only after forcing it back, does white now plant the bishop on b6. The queen is hit, so queen e7 is necessary. Now white sees that the only open file is the d file. The rook on a1 is therefore brought onto that open file. Now in this position, black's best bet would have been bishop g4, exchanging pieces. But this is a difficult move to play because from black's perspective, from Grishuk's perspective, this bishop doesn't look like such a good piece because the bishop is pointing at its own pawns, and so it's blocked in. So instead, Grishuk played the move bishop e6. However, this was a mistake because it allowed white to launch the knight into the center with knight to d5. And now, after knight d5, black has many pieces attacked, and so he must take this knight. If he takes, however, with a knight, then after e takes d5, the bishop is forced to move. And if the bishop moves, we suddenly see that there is a battery here on the f-file. The queen and the rook are combining. Look at white's great coordination. He has a battery with the queen and the bishop along the g1a7 diagonal. And then he has a battery with the queen and the rook along the f-file. And so white can play the move bishop h5 and there is too much pressure on the pawn on f7. If black deals with it with the move g6, now white uses this passed pawn playing d6 and the position becomes very unpleasant for black. In fact, it is uh, close to lost. For example, after queen e6, white would come in with the knight on c5 and it is impossible to defend um, all the different points in a good way. So therefore, after the move knight to d5, Black was forced to give up his bishop. And now we see that Magnus Carlsen would be quite happy with this position because remember we spoke about how an isolated pawn is usually not such a great thing and now the pawn is no longer an isolated pawn because to the E file there is no pawn but on the C file he has, um, he has a pawn. So it is no longer isolated, it can be supported by the C pawn, and we will see soon how relevant this becomes. Now, another detail about this exchange is that black now has a passed pawn. It has no moves, it has no pawns opposing it. White similarly has a passed pawn. So black tries to use his passed pawn, and white does the same thing. He ignores the attack on the bishop and plays pawn to d6, hitting the queen. Now, Black's best bet would have been to centralize his queen on e5, but he makes a mistake. He puts the queen on e6. The problem with putting the queen on e6 is that now the knight can move into the game with a tempo, gaining a tempo on the queen. Black does not have time to capture the bishop, and so here he moved his queen to f5. Now white brought his bishop back. Black exchange the queens, and here black has the problem that the pawn on b7 is under attack, and it's not so easy to defend it because white has many threats here. One of the threats is to capture on b7, but another threat is to push the pawn to d7, attack the rook, and after this promote, 
the bishop here is doing a great job of controlling the queening square. And if knight takes b7 happens anytime soon, the knight will also be controlling the queening square. So we can see that Grishuk is already in trouble because white's passed pawn is stronger than black's passed pawn. As well, white has the bishop pair, and usually this is an advantage over having a combination of two knights and a bishop instead. So here, black plays the move knight b to d5. This move makes sense because it attacks the bishop, and at the same time, it attacks the pawn by blocking off the rook's defense of the pawn. Here, white defended his bishop with the move pawn to a5. And black took the opportunity to capture it. Now, the good news for black is that he no longer had to worry about this strong bishop that was controlling the queening square, and white no longer has the bishop pair. The bad news is that this pawn on b6 here is now quite advanced. And we will see in the future how this becomes a real problem for black. Black probably should go after both pawns, and the most efficient way would be to play rook c8, attacking the knight, and after b4, to have played rook c6, attacking the pawns simultaneously. Here, after knight takes pawn on b7, white would still be doing a lot better than black, but black would have some chances. However, Grishuk here goes wrong, plays a very natural move, rook to b8, defending the pawn on b7. And now Magnus plays a clever but simple tactic. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like to try and solve it for yourself. What do you think white played here? Okay, so now I will show the solution. Rook takes f6. This is a clever exchange sacrifice, but it's only a temporary exchange sacrifice. Because after pawn takes f6, white's follow-up is knight to d7. This attacks the rook on b8, but also threatens the pawn on f6. So if black moves his rook, then knight takes f6 will follow, and this will be a fork. White will recover his exchange, and he will also have won a pawn. So after knight d7, Grishuk understood that he must lose uh, his exchange back, and so he simply left the rook hanging and played f5 to save his pawn. And now Magnus plays a beautiful move here. Remember we had commented that these two pawns, the combination of two advanced pawns, was going to hurt Grishuk later on, and so Magnus now starts a pawn storm with the move pawn to c4. He is not concerned about winning this rook immediately, because he still has the option of knight f6. So if, for example, rook d8, white will play knight f6 check and collect this rook instead. Magnus does not mind which rook he wins. So black understood this and played a5. One of the ideas behind this move is that now b4 is no longer a possibility if white wants to storm pawns further. Magnus continued playing c5, and now black took care of the threat of knight f6, bishop to g7. We also see a second idea behind the move a5. Black understands that all these pawns are very scary and he tries to generate a passed pawn of his own. Black would like to capture on b2 and then push this pawn and promote. However, we can see that white is leading the race by, uh, well, by a mile. So now that knight f6 is no longer a possibility, Magnus took the rook on b8. And rook takes b8. The problem here is that if white pushes the pawn with d7, black will put his bishop on f6, and the opposite colored bishops on the board means that while white has excellent control of the light squares, black has excellent control of the dark squares. And so it can be very difficult for white to break through because black covers all the dark squares. There is another important detail. If black is given enough time, he will block the pawn here, 
And then he will move his bishop and start taking all these pawns of whites that are on dark squares. So Magnus needed to be creative in this position and needed to find a way to crash through with his pawns. So this is a really tough test, but if you wish, you can pause the video again and try and find the great move that Magnus played here. Okay, so I will now show. Magnus went after the b7 pawn. Imagine if this pawn could be got rid of, then these three pawns would all be connected past pawns and they would steamroll the rook. So he played the move bishop to a6, a really beautiful move. Now, if b takes a6, we see that the three pawns will roll up the board. So Grishuk played bishop f6 and ignored the bishop. But Magnus insisted on his plan. He took on b7. And after rook takes b7, he has finally gotten the three passed pawns, connected pass pawns. Now he pushed forward with c6, sacrificing the b6 pawn, and now played a very calm move, rook to c1. The threat is c7. This is a beautiful move because if you play c7 immediately, black can get behind the pawn. But in rook and pawn endgames, it's often very, very effective if you put your own rook behind the pawn. So here rook c1 creates the threat of c7. Now if rook b8, white will play c7 anyway, and after any rook move, white will play d7 and its unstoppable threat of promotion on c8. So in this position, therefore, Grishuk desperately took on b2, hoping perhaps that after a move like rook c2, bishop to e5 attacking this pawn would create two threats. The first is to capture the pawn, and if the pawn moves, then the second would be checkmate along the back rank. But Magnus, after bishop takes b2, was unconcerned about his rook, and he simply played pawn to d7. And here, Grishuk resigned. There is no risk of checkmate for Magnus, and if bishop takes rook, then white will promote to a queen, and not only will he now have a queen, but after king to g7, the rook on b6 is falling, so the position is completely hopeless. This game was so instructive and so beautifully handled by Magnus that the great Gary Kasparov remarked after the game that Magnus Carlsen had just played an absolutely brilliant game. So I hope that you agree with Kasparov's uh, sentiment and I hope you found the game not only instructive but enjoyable and I will see you in another video soon.